Okay, we're halfway through the year of 2019. It's the 4th of July, so I figured I'd give you my WWE and NXT uh, mid-year thoughts, analysis, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so let's start with the WWE first. I mean, I just get the feeling a lot of you guys that are subscribed to the channel, the the, the mentality is that the WWE is just, um, you know, not that interesting this year. Um, not a lot to talk about. Um I just I just get the feeling that a lot of you guys are somewhat bored with the WWE. That that's the feeling that I'm getting, and I, I would somewhat agree. I, I think it's been an up and down year. There's been some good things, uh, and there's also been some just you know just very very bland and average, and just where's the sense of urgency? That that's the feeling that I get from the WWE uh, for the most part. And um, with NXT, I mean, there's really nothing to complain about at all. But I'm just going to uh, start with the Royal Rumble. This is going to be kind of a pay-per-view analysis to a degree. Uh, the, the major complaint with the Rumble, it's no secret. I think, and Trademark even sent this to me. I didn't see the Rumble live, but his complaint was that the women kind of took the life out of the show. It was just too much to sit through a women's Rumble and a men's Rumble. And then when I actually watched the show, I said, oh, fuck, this is going to be bad i mean if they're going to do this every year you're not going to get those classic title matches out of the rumble and you know seth rollins victory yeah it was cool i actually thought the men's rumble came off great but the, the feeling the feeling was just kind of uh, underwhelming when rollins won i mean you, you're asking those people to sit through five maybe six hours of uh, programming and by the time the victory is over even evan roberts said this on sports radio wfam by the time the rumble was over it was just like who really cares and and that's not good um to me I, I was I said this earlier on in the 2018 pay-per-view rewind. I just think the best thing to do is have the women rumble women's rumble at the evolution pay-per-view. I think you could do that all women's pay-per-view once a year, and I think that's where you have to have the women's Royal Rumble. I just think it's it's just too much to ask. And at, at this point, having a you know 30 women in the rumble, it's just you know I just think it was kind of a a chore to sit through the whole show. Um, and, you know, it, it definitely hurt the title matches. And even that Brock Lesnar-Finn Balor match, that got, like, no attention at all. Like, no, no one no one has talked about that uh, ever since the Rumble. And th that was a match I was actually looking forward to. And it, it got off to a good start. But by the by the end of that match, you just you just felt kind of underwhelmed by it. And same thing goes for Brian and AJ. I thought Brian and AJ at the Rumble, you know, with the right atmosphere and the right placement on the card, that, that could have been a, a classic match. So, uh, you know, Rollins' uh, performance in the Rumble, the actual men's match, I thought it came off really, really good. But by the time it was over, you could just feel that the life was sucked out of the crowd. So it should just be interesting to see what changes WWE makes. Maybe they're just going to stick with this. Maybe this is just what they're going to do from now on. But in my opinion, I just think it's a major problem. Um, next up, you have the Elimination Chamber. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Chamber... I, I thought it, it gave us the match of the year. You know, you got Kofi Kingston and Daniel Bryan battling it out in the finals of the Elimination Chamber. So it's hard to knock the pay-per-view because it, it did deliver this year. But I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just kind of fed up with the Chamber pay-per-view. I just think it's... Uh, I, I just think it's been going on way too long. Uh, I, I just find it very, very... not Not predictable, but... You know, I, I just think the Elimination Chamber, the, the best use of it is just to do it on occasion or unexpectedly i thought survivor series 2002 it worked i thought SummerSlam 2003 uh the goldberg elimination chamber worked and that you know they started doing it every new year's revolution and somehow some way it morphed into no way out and they got rid of no way out and now it became the elimination chamber a road to wrestlemania thing i, I think the marketing thing of it is you could you provide the royal rumble anything can happen you provide the elimination chamber you know all these guys in the match you know you don't know who's going to go to wrestlemania so it, it, it creates that unpredictable atmosphere of uh you know who's going to main event wrestlemania so I, I understand it from a marketing standpoint I, i'm just saying at this point i think the chamber pay-per-view the chamber match right before wrestlemania I just think it's run its course. And then you're throwing in another pay-per-view, uh, Fastlane, which is another you know show to set up WrestleMania, which is fine. I mean, it's nothing to complain about. The Shield main event is the last time the Shield was going to wrestle because Dean Ambrose wasn't going to come back to the WWE. So I'm okay with it. I thought we had too much of the Shield farewell. I think the Shield, for the most part, has been overpushed. Two out of the three, in my opinion, were heavily overpushed as singles wrestlers, but... 
you know, fast lane. Um, really, I thought the Miz and Shane McMahon. You know, it was a good pay per view to set up Shane McMahon's heel turn. It was just, it was just a good show to do right before WrestleMania. It set up the women's match. You know, it does what it does. Um, really, not a lot to complain about in terms of uh, fast lane. In, in the past, it's it's come off extremely underwhelming, extremely fillerish. Uh, but but I think this past year, it it actually came off really really well. Uh, WrestleMania. WrestleMania 35. Uh, looking back on it, you know, it, it was pretty well received. I, I think most people agreed that it was the best WrestleMania since WrestleMania 31. Uh, to me, I, I just, I, I'm just of the mindset is that the pay per view needs to uh, do better. I just feel really underwhelmed every year with WrestleMania. You still haven't gotten that amazing WrestleMania in a very, very long time. I mean, when's the last time WrestleMania has delivered uh, a show that that you could consider in the 8.5 to 9.0 range? I, I just don't think it's happened recently. And and the problem with this WrestleMania, especially since they've been you know giving the women more opportunities, it, they, they they all kind of feel like the same WrestleMania. Uh, th this past year, I I'll say it was definitely an improvement. They, they gave you one of the greatest matches in WrestleMania over the last couple of years with Brian and Kofi. At the same time, they gave you the women to main event the show, which was definitely a breath of fresh air uh, compared to seeing Roman Reigns in the main event. So, so this past WrestleMania, I I'll say it was better, but still, like, like for a, a, a casual fan like myself that used to be a diehard fan, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it's still not, you know, WrestleMania as a whole, it, it's still really not, you know, um, what I'm looking for. Uh, Money in the Bank. Uh, so they got rid of Backlash and they did a Money in the Bank pay-per-view uh, in May to follow up WrestleMania. You know, what when we were growing up back in the day or not growing up, but, you know, back almost 10 years ago, Money in the Bank was a July pay-per-view. Now they're moving it to May. Um, you know, I, I think the, the marketing behind this was so you could have Brock Lesnar, uh, so you could tease Brock Lesnar. Uh, on the next show in Saudi Arabia. So I, I think that's why they moved Money in the Bank to right after WrestleMania. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the thing that kind of stood out about Money in the Bank, I was high, highly uh, disappointed for the guys that worked their ass off in the Money in the Bank ladder match. I mean, they, they you got all those guys, you know, tape, putting their lives on the line, taking risks. Then all of a sudden, Lesnar comes out and just grabs a briefcase after not really doing anything. Yeah, you kind of feel bad because of that. But I, I understand it from a marketing standpoint. You never have Brock as the Money in the Bank winner. And, and because Brock has the briefcase, it's like, oh, you don't know when he's going to strike. He could come on any Raw, any SmackDown, or, or uh, you know, any pay-per-view and just cash in. So it, it, it creates that, oh, man, is Brock going to show up? You could always promote it if you don't feel like the promotion is good enough. So it, it's kind of smart uh, when you look at it from that aspect. But, um, yeah. Money in the Bank as a whole, um, you know, you, they gave us a Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles dream match. So I still thought Money in the Bank was actually a solid show. And then you get the Super Showdown, and then you get the Stomping Grounds. Just two shows that really left you feeling empty. Uh, I thought two shows that just really, um, really just left you feeling like the WWE, you know, played you. Uh, to be completely honest, I mean, stomping grounds, you know, they, they added some stuff to the show to really, uh, you know, beef up the card. So you, you weren't left totally unhappy. But but, you know, Super Showdown, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Goldberg versus The Undertaker. Uh, you know, looking back on it, I, I just think it was kind of unnecessary. I understand, you know, the, the money was too good for Goldberg to pass up. I was actually surprised Goldberg actually took the match and was willing to do the job to The Undertaker. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just think most people... Um, that are mature enough just don't want to watch Undertaker wrestle at this point. And on top of that, you're asking Taker to go out there and carry Bill Goldberg. It made for a nightmarish combination. And, and, and a lot of people just thought they, you know, a lot of people thought it should have been harder on that match. But, you know, I, I tried to be as respectful as I could because you got you got two legends out there. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, looking back on it, it you, you just kind of wish it never happened. And, you know, I, I, I've kind of learned my lesson. I think the Saudi Arabia pay-per-views or any of these pay-per-views that they're going to show on the network that are uh, international, 
no, they're glorified house shows and they're not worth really spending the time on. You know, Super Showdown at the time, it had you curious. You had Brock cashing in. You know, the card didn't look that bad. But when you actually sit down and watch the card, yeah, it, it felt like a glorified house show. All right, so let's move on to uh, NXT. I, I mean, I'll tell you, man, NXT from uh, 2019 so far, very little you can pl complain about. The, the talent pool is, is excellent right here. And, and you know, w w with, with the NXT roster, it, it just got you... You know, like imagine how good Ring of Honor could have been had they not fired Gabe Sapolsky and, and Ring of Honor really was the main independent wrestling company in the early 2010s. I mean, you could have gotten Gargano, Adam Cole, Ricochet. Uh, you, you could have gotten Seth Rollins, uh, uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, all these guys on the same roster. Uh, the, the Ring of Honor championship would have felt so competitive. I, I, I really think, you know, Ring of Honor could have had their best years. You know, around 2000, you know, 13, 14, 15, around that time, if, if they had kept all these guys together and not and not fired the, the main guy in charge of everybody. So uh, it's just something to think about. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the story of NXT this year has been Johnny Gargano. He had three matches that, you know, people have given five stars. I mean, when's the last time someone's had five or three five star matches in, in half a year? Uh, it's incredible. You had the match against Ricochet for the North American Championship at the Phoenix Royal Rumble weekend. And then he had the two back-to-back -back classics with uh, Adam Cole. You know, it's tough to say what was the best match out of those. I, I think the last fall, WrestleMania weekend between Johnny Gargano and Adam Cole, that's probably the best stuff that that Gargano's done out of the five-star matches. You know, that, that last fall was incredible. Uh, yeah, I've never seen near falls like that and excitement like that in, in a while. So I, I'll probably say the two out of three falls match. That last fall was just uh, incredible. But, uh, you know, that, that Gargano-Ricochet match, that's probably going to get overshadowed. But I, I don't know if we've seen two better athletes in the ring at the same time uh than those two i mean that that was an once again another incredible match and ricochet's off to a hot start in the wwe I, I really think he is he had the great match with joe he seems to be making the transition to the main roster a lot smoother than a lot of the other guys did better than nakamura better than oscar definitely better than bailey so so ricochet uh, he's off to a good start on the main roster i would definitely say yeah you got fish o'reilly and strong Undisputed Era, you know, they've been incredible uh, as a whole so far with Adam Cole. Uh, the, all these guys, they look even better and more mature and better conditioned, even even more experienced than they were in Ring of Honor. Um, so wish those guys all the best. They've been awesome so far. Uh, Matt Riddle, I think Matt Riddle uh, can main event WrestleMania one day. I, I think he's that good. I think he's that talented. He's different. Uh, he's got a great look. He's got a, a different personality. He could definitely uh, wrestle in the ring. I mean, I I started watching him and Evolve in 2016 and just a couple matches, but he really struck my attention. And uh, yeah, man, he, 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 you know, some people say he got off to a slow start. He had the, the match with Cassius Ono. You know, Hero... Heroes really let himself go, so he's going to kind of be like a, you know, it, it seemed like he was being like a veteran, putting over the younger guy, but it seemed like when Riddle had the matches with Velveteen Dream, and then the match with Roderick Strong, he got two back-to-back -back really good matches from Riddle there, so I definitely think Riddle will be uh, NXT champion before the year is over, then Velveteen Dream's been, you know, just, uh, you know, he just brings a little bit of everything to the table as far as his charisma, and, uh, you know, what he can do in the ring, so yeah, NXT, uh, you know, as far as the takeovers go, they're, they're in a can't lose situation. The shows are short. You get you, 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 you with the NXT shows, you kind of filter out all of the casual fans or the non wrestling fans, and all you know, it just creates such an ultra hot atmosphere. So, you know, I, I mean, NXT, I mean, it, it's good for me because I don't, you know, I don't have the time and the money to invest in Ring of Honor and PWG anymore. So, you're kind of getting the best and the best with NXT on the network or even like in a show like Evolve 31. So, of Evolve 131, so uh, I'm loving NXT because I don't watch it that much, but whenever I do watch it, it's all it's always thoroughly satisfying, and there's really never anything to complain about. So, yeah, I, I think NXT is awesome, uh, especially for some of the older guys that you know don't want to invest that much time in the wrestling anymore. So that's what's good about it. And I end the video like this: we got Paul Heyman 
and Eric Bischoff, uh, executive producers of Raw and SmackDown. And, you know, it's about time. I mean, what does Vince have to lose? I mean, the only thing I'd be worried about is the sponsors. Uh, obviously, you don't want to push the envelope too too far because they're probably afa- afraid of uh, losing the sponsorship money. Also, the merchandise, I'm worried about that. I'm worried that they're, you know, my, the, the biggest problem with the WWE for the last 10 years, it's been the reluctance to turn guys heel because you don't want to lose out on the merchandise money or you don't want to offend this person or offend that person or offend that demographic. Uh, you know, this kind of like they're le- learning the lessons from the Stone Cold Steve Austin heel turn. But, you know, I, I think heels are what's going to drive the show. And I watched the first Heyman Raw, watched the first half of the SmackDown, Eric Bischoff uh, SmackDown live show. And man, I, I was really impressed with both shows. I, I really got to say, you, you could definitely see the influence from the opening match with uh Strowman and Lashley with the, with with the must see spot with the holy shit uh, reaction from Corey Graves. I thought that was uh, you know unexpected, cutting edge. Obviously, and not just that. Even the Maria promo uh, later on in the show with with uh, the prodigy Mike Bennett. I th- I thought she, she was great. You could tell Heyman had his fingerprints all over that angle. Uh, the ending to the show with AJ turning heel on Ricochet. Uh, yeah, I mean, th- that was a great heel turn, great match. Um, you know, the-, the whole show really just kept me engaged, even the whole Alexa Bliss thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on. I thought I thought, I thought, the first Raw with Heyman, you could definitely see the improvements. Wasn't a perfect show from top to bottom. But, um, you know, I-, I agree with Heyman, though. I think the, the general manager thing it- had just gotten stale. I love Kurt Angle, but you got to be honest, every time they brought Kurt Angle out, it just felt like a waste of time. And, you know, instead of investing time in a general manager, you just you just you just go to another promo or go to another segment or or develop the characters at at a faster pace to just keep people engaged or keep people from uh, switching the channel. And, you know, the Bischoff uh, show, um, the whole thing with Kofi giving Joe the finger, um, you know, me just talking about it doesn't sound that. Um, creative, but if, if you watch that whole segment uh, with, with execution of Joe's promo and, and and the suspense that that you felt when when Joe st- stuck his hand out and, and Kofi gave him the finger, uh, it just came off really really well. And uh, I I, th- I think Bischoff could get his creative juices flowing uh, if he's really into something if, and if if his heart is really in it. But you know we'll see how long it lasts. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see how long it's going to take Paul Heyman to start fighting with Vince McMahon. I'm sure Vince is. Gonna to want to interfere and, and tone it down a bit at some point but you know what does Vince have to lose I, I just think Vince should just sit back and you know give himself a pat on the back and just relax man it's just it's just been too long since he's been in charge and um you know he's always going to be the main filter but you know uh I I'm, I'm really engaged with uh, a- a- anything Paul Heyman does you know it's funny this comes right after the ECW rewind that I just did and uh, it's funny how Heyman was announced executive producer the same week. So, yeah, that was kind of weird for me from, from a personal standpoint. But uh, but, yeah, you know, hopefully the WWE turns things around and, um, you know, just improves uh, throughout throughout the year. I, you know, I mean, it hasn't been a great year so far. I have the top 10 matches in the description, but you guys already know what the top 10 is. Probably dominated by NXT and then Daniel Bryan, Kofi Kingston, you know, matches like that. They'll probably sneak into the top 10 as well. But uh, that's pretty much it, guys. Hope you enjoy the video. And uh, all right. Take care.